Good morning. Um, this is the second part of week seven, interpersonal violence. This section is specifically on uh, rape and sexual assault. We're going to talk about definitions, recent trends, uh, historical changes in laws, patterns of offending and victimization, motives, the use of rape in warfare, the normality of it, and patriarchy. Um, this brief discussion of the culture that supports it, and then just kind of a wrap-up of interpersonal violence um, and inequality. So definitions, there's a few. Um, rape is defined in criminal law as the quote-unquote carnal knowledge um, of a female forcibly and against her will. Um, there's this difference between forcible rape and rape um, that the text talks about just with the threat of violence for it to occur. Um, I don't call it forcible rape. It's just rape. Um, so that's just what we're going to call it. Um, statutory rape is um, having sexual sexual relations with someone who is not able to give legal consent. Um, usually that person is a minor. Um, these lovely people on the side, Miss Peterson was a school teacher. Roman Polanski was a movie director who is still um, living in exile, I believe, uh, avoiding prison time. <laughs> and then sexual assault is just kind of this broader term which can include anything from unwanted touching um, exposure watching or photographing people um, without their knowledge uh, recent trends um, like murder um, the rates for rape are down and have been since the early 90s. Uh, between 91 and 2009, the arrest rate declined by 56%. Um, and in 2013, it was the lowest it's been since the 70s. As far as historical changes in the laws... Um, they definitely reflect changes in power differences between men and women. From the old Jewish, uh, Old Testament Jewish codes to medieval Europe, uh, rape was treated as a property offense because women were owned by their husbands. So if a woman was assaulted, it was a crime against her husband's property. Um, most legal traditions exempted husbands from raping their wives. So because of the property law, because she is owned by him, technically he can't commit a crime against her in that way because that is something that is his. Um, today's definitions um, are contentious uh, for a number of reasons. There are issues with the nature of penetration, whether or not it has to be a penis or whether or not it could be a foreign object or fingers or anything else. Um, the amount of force that's required, um, whether or not the person is resisting enough, and then the same issues with marriage are still present, unfortunately. Um, so popular definitions tend to lag 
behind legal definitions. Um, this is that gender stratification in action. Uh, date rape is less likely to be identified by the offender or the victim um, because of the popular understanding that there's just kind of this quid pro quo of dating. You know, if you're dating somebody, then, you know, well, he took me out. We had a really good time. I kind of owe him or, you know, vice versa where, you know, I spent all this money. I took her out. She had a good time. You know, she owes me for that. Um, that's kind of the thought process for some people, but legally that's not really how it works. Um, some really disturbing stuff here, and I, I'd like to see this repeated to see what the actual numbers are today. Um, but in 89, they did a survey of, survey of 6,000 students. Um, these are college kids, and um, th across 32 different colleges, so this is a pretty big span, and found that nearly 90% of guys um, who admitted that they had, in fact, used force to obtain sex were very adamant that they were definitely not committing rape. So even though, by definition, they said, well, yeah, I was, you know, it's that dirty word that they don't want to, you know, be known as a rapist, um, when in fact they are, um, only 20%, 27% of the women who experience, um, whose experience met the definition of rape, rape actually considered themselves to be rape victims. So this is that, um, the either not seeing it for what it was or not wanting to believe it or blaming themselves for something that they did to make it happen. Um, that's where that comes in. So what, what do people think today? You know, is there still this kind of blindness to it? Um, there's this big debate on um, whether or not you consent when you're intoxicated. Um, you know, whether or not it's just drunk sex or whether it's date rape. And a study of sexual victimization of college women showed that 9 out of 10 victims knew the person that victimized them. And they estimated that in the course of a college career, which is about 5 years, the percentage of completed or attempted rape among women in college and universities is still as high as 25%. So that's one in four um, college-age women are the most likely um, group to be victimized. So gender differences, um, this is where we're going to start talking about the um, dominant patterns. Sorry about that. Um, so difference is in dominant patterns um, in regards to gender. Rape is clearly an act whereby men victimize women in an act of violence. Um, not to say that men can't be raped. But in general, as a rule, it is almost always female victims, male perpetrators. 98% um, of guys or people arrested are male. Um, when women are charged, it's generally statutory. And again, that's the underage. Um, there was recently... Um, a thing in the news where one of the women involved in the Me Too movement was um, there was some light shed that she had indeed had sex with a 17 year old co-star um, in California. The problem with that is in California the age of consent is 18 so she had committed statutory rape and she had in fact paid him off to um, 
not discuss it. But that right there, that's kind of the idea. Um, in the male prison setting, where rape is completely an issue of power and control, um, that's unquestionable. Um, rape is a very important mechanism in establishing and maintaining the hierarchy among inmates within prison. Um, and that is transferred into society as well. That's a rape is a power move. It is a exercise in control and power, um, more than anything sexual. An estimated 60,000 state and federal prisoners were assaulted during one year in 2007. Um, there's also reports of abuse by staff, which are way more common than reports of abuse by other inmates. So, um, again, this is that power struggle where you have someone in a position of power, which are the staff, who are assaulting people who are... Um, you know, quote unquote, lower than them on the totem, um, which are the prisoners. Um, juveniles, illegal immigrants, um, men that are more slightly built, um, and those who are sexually inexperienced um, were the most likely to be raped in prison. And then the idea of you know, quote unquote, hooking up for protection um, among male inmates is common also. Um, oh, I lost my chart here. No, oh, I just, whoa. Uh, okay. I'm going to have to fix this. Um, so age patterns, according to statistics, rape offenders and victims tended to be young, usually under 25. Teenagers, 16 to 19, were more than twice as likely as any other age group to be the victims of sexual assault and rape. In terms of arrest, 45% of those arrested under 25, or were under 25, and 62% are under age 30. So the peak age is between 18 and 24, and then followed by the 25 to 29. So this kind of has that same overlap as the murder rates that we talked about in the previous one, um, with the, the peak age being around that 18 to 25. Um, and the similar age pattern is found when we look at marital rape I don't think this is going to let me, let me pause this for a second. Okay, so I got them fixed. Sorry about that. So in regards to ethnicity, um, again, African Americans are overrepresented over in arrest statistics. In 2008, almost 32% of those arrested were black which is three times their representation in the population. And then 63% were white or non-Caucasian or non-Hispanic Caucasian, however the census thing fills it out. Um, during the past 10 years, there's been a significant decline in rape and sexual assault for the black, black population. Um, like homicide, this is a intra-racial act where, you know, white on white, black on black, etc. Um, African American women have a slightly higher rate of reported rape than white women do. The racial victimization pattern may be a result of differences in rates of poverty between the two populations. Um, just like murder, um, economic status 
family stress, um, all of those same things that apply to murder also apply to rape. So poverty has a big role to play in those, which may account for the difference. Or it may be, you know, some cultural thing about reporting. Um, these are those charts that were covering up the slides earlier. Um, if you can see the age of victimization on the top, peaks um, around 15, this is that, you know, 15 to 18 area. Um, and those are the age of the victim. And then there's the race of the offender and what they, um, sorry, the acts of violence. Um, you know, that you don't really need the robbery, but, um, the rape slash sexual assault, um, you can see that it's higher. Uh, special case for Native Americans. Um, Amnesty International, uh, this may be higher at this point, but had said before that one third of Native American women will be raped in their lifetime. Um, and if you look at the statistics for all other women, it's between one in four and one in five. So they have a significantly higher rate um, with the Jur Bureau of Justice um, looking at trends, Native Americans experience a victimization rate that was two and a half times greater than for whites and blacks. And this is a different pattern than what we're seeing in the general population where we had just talked about how it's generally white on white or black on black. In the case of Native Americans, it's generally whites committing rape against a Native American woman. And that's 80% of the time. And again, if we look at the dominant patterns here of how poverty feeds into this and hierarchies and stuff like that. This is a ethnic minority, which means the rates of victimization are higher. They're Native Americans, which means that overall they experience higher rates of poverty and um, unemployment, extremely low socioeconomic status. Um, all of these things feed into that which means that when you have this totem, they're, they're sitting at the bad spot on the table in multiple, <laughs> multiple tables. Um, so the, it, the effect on Native American women is compounded by all of those factors. Oh, geez, another table. Okay. Sorry, I'm still working on getting my life together. It's a little early. Okay, so social class. Just like we said with murder and homicide, the most likely victims who actually report rape and the offenders caught, um, regardless of race or ethnicity, come from relatively low socioeconomic neighborhoods in larger cities. The, what we know about the offender's class background is not as clear. Um, some research has suggested that there's a bias in the judicial process, whereby men of middle class backgrounds are less likely to be successfully tried and convicted than men of traditional working class backgrounds. Um, 
this is the case of the um, Ivy League swimmer who got caught um, red-handed sexually assaulting a woman outside of a party and he got you know this is a white male upper class um, he got I believe six months of probation for raping a woman um, there was no gray area he was literally caught by two other gentlemen he even admitted to having relations with this woman there was um, physical evidence aside from them seeing it happen um, and he still only got six months so if that doesn't say anything about the role of social class I don't know what does if that would have happened at IPFW or PFW, sorry, um, where we're not all upper class um, Harvard students or Ivy League students, um, I guarantee one of you would have went to prison for a very long time um, if it were the same circumstances. Anyway, I digress. Sorry, I admit I get a little flustered um, discussing this section. Um, also, marital rape studies don't clearly indicate a class pattern either um, for victimization or offending. Um, here's this lovely table where it just goes over victimization against females by the characteristics of the women. So how old is she? And you can kind of see the trends and how they've changed between 94 and 2010. Um, I couldn't find a more up-to-date table, but this kind of shows where um, some of these patterns are going down. You can still see the same um, range, though, of, you know, the, um, the lower income, the... Um, age, race, stuff like that. Um, if you see where it says American Indian, Alaska Native up here in this race and Hispanic origin, extremely high. And then when you get to um, two or more races, that's also very high. But these are those, um, a lot of that is... Um, racial minorities, ethnic minorities that are generally have higher rates of victimization anyway. So that's where you're seeing that. And then if you look down at location, um, urban and rural are relatively high. And I would argue that that's because both of those tend to have lower um, socioeconomic status. Um, victim and offender relationships. Um, this is extremely important. Most victimization studies have shown that the majority of rapes are among persons who are at least they were or are romantically involved. So according to the Department of Justice, 79% of either attempted or completed rapes were committed by non-strangers. So despite what the um, people on TV or movies or news conferences would like to tell you, you are extremely, extremely unlikely to get sexually assaulted walking down the street unless it's by somebody that knows you and happens to see you out walking. <laughs> um, it's not a stranger hiding in the bushes. 
it is more than likely that guy that you know from school or that coworker or that guy that you know from Starbucks that sees an opportunity um, and decides to act on it. Um, reporting bias also has the potential to exaggerate the incidence of stranger um, rape because if it's someone you don't know, you're more than likely going to view it as a crime and run to the police. If it's somebody you know, you're more likely or the victim is more likely to say, okay, what did I do to cause this? Oh, or they make excuses for the person. You know, he was drunk. He didn't know what he was doing. Um, maybe I led him on. Um, he's not usually like this. If I go and report this, what is this going to do? How are people going to view me? Um, what if nobody believes me? The incidence of marital rape is along the same line. It's extremely underestimated um, because of the same things we just talked about, as well as the reluctance to promote enforcement. There's no... Um, campaigns out there saying, hey, ladies, if your husband is sexually assaulting you and raping you, you need to call the police. Um, there's the reluctance to report on the part of the victim. You know, if if I call the police, what's going to happen? What's that going to do to my marriage? Is anybody going to believe me? Um, stuff like that. And then there's also the reluctance by the police and the district attorneys to enforce the laws regarding marital rape. Um, unfortunately, it's not just, you know, yes, we're married, but this is what happened. They're like, well, you know, you're married and are you sure? And there's a lot of questioning and a lot of victim blaming. Um, there's a lot of reasons why victims don't report this kind of stuff. And in the instances of marital rape, there's not really a lot that anyone's doing to try to change because the police aren't going after it. They're not encouraging people to step forward. And when they do, they're not doing much to stop it from happening again. So that's unfortunate. Um, motives. So are the motives a result of these people being psychotic or having some sort of psychological um, issue? Um, they talk about a few different types of rape. Um, power, anger, sadistic, um, Generally speaking, less than 5% of men were considered psychotic when they raped someone. Um, yes, there are different underlying things. You know, there's the power, which is an assertion of control and domination. Um, anger, um, when they're angry, frustrated at the person. Um, the sadistic where you're just, um, a need to inflict suffering. Um, I would say a lot of these are, um, more like serial rapists, um, where you have like the strong pathology, um, serial murderers that also commit rape with, with their victims. Um, that's where a lot of that stuff comes in. Um, generally speaking, there's very little evidence that rapists are psychotic or psychologically abnormal. Um, and the most promising approach is that the motives are a manifestation of gender relations. Um, we have set up this patriarchal system and rape is a manifestation of that um, need for um, males to dominate. There are 
links between the structural and cultural factors with, you know, situations, um, as is the case with violence in general. This is just another form of it. And to say, well, that's different. This is obviously sexual. You know, the saying that rape is obviously sexual is like saying that, you know, beating someone is the physical act of punching. Um, that's not what it is. So even though this is the manifestation of what it, you know, and how, what it looks like when it comes out, um, that doesn't change the fact of what it is. I hope that makes sense. Um, revenge and punishment motive. Um, in a lot of cases, the rape victim was a substitute, um, for the actual person that they are wanting revenge on. Um, sexual access, um, men who feel that they're entitled, um, because sex has either been withheld for them or rape is the only means of getting sex from a particular person. Um, here recently, um, there has been a lot of, um, news and exposure to the incel movement. These are the um, gentlemen online who um, are part of this subgroup, you know, rape culture, who, you know, have decided that, um, you know, they're not able to obtain sex from these, um, women who they feel that they should be allowed to. Um, there's a lot of glorification of rape, um, in these, um, chat rooms and writings. Um, I will post a link to some news stories for those of you who haven't read it about them yet or have missed, um, this, uh, lovely view into, um, online culture. Um, it's interesting, extremely disturbing. Um, but in this context, I think that it would be, um, extremely educational to read about it and familiarize yourself with some of the things that are underlying, um, these types of behaviors. And then there's the impersonal, um, where sex and power is just another, um, motive when the, they're, they're not really concerned for the victim. Um, you know, it's just kind of a thing. Um, but overall, when we look at the motives and we consider the occurrences of marital and date rape, it's increasingly evident that we're not dealing with abnormal behavior. This is this has been defined as normal and it stems from acceptable ideas and beliefs about gender relationships within our society. This is just an extension of those norms. And um, this other statistic, um, one research project found that 34% of women were victims of sexual um, rape by a husband or intimate partner. Uh, so in wartime, rape has long been considered an act of war. Um, it happens in religious crusades, uh, revolutions, liberations, wars of conquest. Um, this idea of comfort women in Korea before and during World War II these were women who were offered up to soldiers um, to be assaulted by the soldiers in order to um, allow them to have someone to have sex with um, during war times. Um, these were often very young women who were not willing participants. Um, in the 90s, the war in Bosnia was extremely bad. Was uh, Muslim women were systematically raped by soldiers. Um, 
So rape and the patriarch. Um, patriarchs see themselves as superior to their wives simply because they're men. Um, these are gentlemen who believe their wives are their property and that it is the duty of their wives to accommodate them sexually whenever they want. Um, they believe they should be the boss of their marriage and that their wives should behave in a um, subordinate fashion and that if they don't, then they should be punished. There's a double standard that's acceptable for husbands to have other attractions or affairs, um, but it is completely unacceptable for their wives to do the same. And gentlemen, before you get up in arms and say, guys don't really feel this way, this is 2018, this is ridiculous, this is an old world way of thinking, totally not true. There's still gentlemen who believe this way, and a lot of people feel this way if really pressed, um, even if they don't always act it out. So there is an underlying cultural thing. Uh, so the normalcy of it. Um, rape is a form of violence that stems from gender relations, as we said. It's not a de deviation from normal gender relations. Um, as we said, it's not some psychological um, craziness. Um, women in the context of patriarchy are defined as commodities to be acquired and owned in the context of marriage. Uh, historically speaking, rape has been defined as deviant only when it occurs in a violation of the rights of ownership and control. So this is the male perspective defining what rape is um, for a woman. And as, as odd as some of these things are, and ways of thinking might be if you can v turn your view externally and look at the way that some other cultures look at women and marriage in the context of what are they allowed to do? Who runs the home? Who makes the decisions? Um, dowry laws um, where you know, a woman has to pay the man to take her as a bride. Um, if you're having a hard time seeing it in this culture, look at it externally and see if you can see it in another culture. And then once you get kind of the idea of what you're looking for, turn that mirror around and try looking at things in the U.S. again. Even if it's not your experience that these things happen or that this um, viewpoint is prevalent, there are people that have it, and it is something that you should be aware of. Um, rape is problematic not because it reduces the, the rights of men who, to control women. Um, you know, this isn't about a men's right to touch women or say things to women. Um, but because it's a technique for men to control women. Um, women are controlled by the occurrence of rape. If you don't believe me, ladies, how many of you feel comfortable walking across campus at night without a gun, without pepper spray, without a knife, just walking, you know, or how many of you feel comfortable walking from your job to your car in the evenings or from your front door to your mailbox um, or feel safe going down to the bar alone and having a drink or two and not having to worry about 
what's going to happen. Um, guys, if you have a significant other or you have a sister or you have a daughter or you have a mother, do you feel comfortable with her doing any of those things? And if not, why? Those are the reasons why rape is a control factor because it changes what women do. The fear of it changes what we're comfortable doing in our own lives. Rape culture. Um, all of these lovely advertisements. Um, Everything is extremely sexualized. If you look down here at this Dolce and Gabbana ad, um, you know, this gentleman is holding this girl down and there are a lot of guys just kind of gawking um, very creepily. You know, Cosmo always has a how to please your man ad. Um, there's a video on here, uh, Killing Us Softly 3. There's a link to it in the videos. Um, I suggest watching that. Uh, we're almost done, guys. Sorry, this one seems to be dragging out a bit. Um, rape and inequality. As we said, rape is a tactic that maintains the equality because one gender is predominantly victimized by the other. So rape is a consequence of gender equality. You know, across 50 states, comparing countries, um, the less economic inequality, the greater the gender equality, and thus the lower rates of rape. So in egalitarian marriages where the men and the women are equal in societies where there's not a lot of inequality between men and women there's lower rates of sexual assault and rape in places where there is a lot of inequality there are higher rates um, one indication of how rape is related to inequality is to look at how the definition is related to the woman's relationship to men. Um, situations where women are in a relationship with men, either in a marriage or dating, the definition of rape changes. When there's no clear relationship, then rape is rape. If it's a stranger, oh, well, it's obviously rape. But like we said earlier, if it's your husband, if it's your boyfriend, it's a guy that you kind of dated at one point or... Um, maybe you're really good friends with and, the, you know, the guy's in the friend zone and maybe he doesn't like it. Um, that's where the definitions legally um, get a little blurry um, because there's less enforcement and there's less... There's... Um, What's a nice way of saying this? The closer the relationship between the man and the woman, the less likely everyone involved is to believe that it's rape. Even if legally, by definition, it is. So how do gender laws and enforcement, enforcement change as a result of women's empowerment? Um... As we touched on earlier, class and racial inequality. <clears throat> um, men in class and ethnically dominated positions can still dominate women. And this may be important as they experience class and racial oppression as a ways to assert power and control. Um, does the fact that women are more likely to have lower income than men 
impact their level of victimization. They're more likely to make less money. They're more likely to be poor. They're more likely to live in poverty. Um, conditions of poverty in general serve to promote contempt for others. Um, and that contempt is likely to be directed at those who are less powerful, like women. Like we said earlier, if you're more, if you're sitting at a bad spot on the table, you're more likely to be victimized. Think about the, always think about the hierarchy. If you're sitting at a dinner table, where is your seat? If it's white dominant, if we're talking about race, white's at the head of the table. Where are you sitting? If you're anything except white, you're more likely to be victimized. If we're talking about socioeconomic status, upper class, high socioeconomic status, they're at the head of the table. The people at the bottom, they're more likely to be victimized. If we're talking about gender relations, we live in a male dominant society. So if you're not male or you don't identify as male, you are more likely to be victimized. So when we think of who has the highest rates of rape victimization, it is poor black women. And that makes complete sense when we look at the hierarchy for everything. And if we add age in there, it's that 18 to 25 year old group that has been so disenfranchised because they can't find jobs, they can't get an education. Um, that's exactly what we're talking about. So don't think these things are not connected because they are. And that is the point. So conclusions, uh, rape, just like homicide, is a learned strategy to exert power over another person in interpersonal relations. Inequality contributes to the use of violence because it makes the victim vulnerable and because dominance of another is a normative characteristic of the society and the social relations that are endemic to it. The pattern of victimization increases levels of inequality as those at the lower ends of the economic spectrum are in general more seriously affected. And lastly, we see how the structures of inequality can contribute to an increased use of violence as those with the least power rely upon increasingly desperate and violent measures to gain some measure of control for themselves and power over others, which is defined as a value and hierarchically, hierarchically structured societies. So there was so much information in this section and the last section over murder. If you have questions over content, there is a place on Blackboard under discussions where you can post content specific questions. If you need more information, I would be happy to give it to you. If you're doing your case study on interpersonal violence, I really hope that these um, lectures were helpful to you. If you need any kind of guidance as far as picking a case to do your case study on or what type of statistics would be helpful or places to look for statistics, um, check out all of the government sites. The Bureau of Justice is really great. Um, there's a lot of sources as far as government statistics. Um, you can look at state statistics. You can look at local statistics. Um, if you have anything else, you can, you're always welcome to email me um, directly, of course, not as a response to an announcement as it'll go to my spam folder or my clutter folder. Um, 
make sure you're watching the videos, make sure you're keeping up on your quizzes and your, um, well, your learning modules, whether it be a quiz or a video response. And best of luck with keeping up on everything. I hope you guys are enjoying the material.